something went wrong? SpaceX's Starship Super Heavy Booster 9 rolls back after a static fire. Are Raptor 2s unreliable? SpaceX gets the next private ISS mission and Chandrayaan-3 is getting ready to land on the moon again. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Updates this is Starbase, the place where in the not too distant future another orbital pair will try to achieve what the first starship couldn't, reach orbit. To accomplish that, both Booster 9 and Ship 25 have to go through a rigorous test campaign. Lately, the first one reached a major milestone, albeit not without controversy. Alright, let's dive into the launch site's latest happenings. Just a few days ago, Booster 9 conducted a static fire test, igniting all 33 Raptor engines in preparation for the second orbital flight attempt. The dream scenario? All engines roaring to life simultaneously and staying ignited for at least 5 seconds. But as we know, dreams and reality often diverge. Just 2.74 seconds into the static fire, four engines decided to take an early break, ending the test sooner than anticipated. Now this hiccup has sparked some chatter among space enthusiasts and rightfully so. Many say that Raptor development should be a walk in the park, as SpaceX already has the experience of creating one incredibly reliable engine, Merlin 1D the workhorse behind the Falcon 9 rocket. Others are expressing their concerns about encountering problems with the Raptors this late into development. Let's take a step back and see if there is a reason to be worried about Starship's reliability. First, let's talk about the Merlin 1D. Today it's a symbol of engineering excellence, with hundreds of them powering Falcon 9 missions over the years. In 2023 we had a Merlin powered launch every 4 days so far. No issues whatsoever. But its early days were not without challenges. From static fire issues to engine loss during flight, the Merlin 1D had to overcome countless obstacles to become what it is today. Not to mention that while the Falcon 9's engine is still a complex piece of machinery, its construction is many times simpler than that of a Raptor engine. After all, Raptor is the first full flow staged combustion cycle engine to ever take to the skies. Secondly, even with its initial problems, the Raptor's reliability has already improved quite substantially. Remember the days of Starship Serial Number 8? The one that was the first ever to complete a 12 km flight. It was plagued with engine issues that no longer appear. Some of you may not know, but those who have been following Y for a really long time will recall that back then engines were swapped after almost every single static fire. That was the norm for Starship. Now let's compare Booster 7 and Booster 9. SpaceX did a successful static fire with Booster 7, so why is Booster 9 struggling? To answer this question, let's take a closer look at what Booster 7's test campaign actually looked like. It was a journey filled with ups and downs. An initial failed spin prime test led to an explosion, forcing SpaceX to repair the vehicle. Then the entire campaign had to slow down, gradually increasing the number of tested engines. More spin primes, static fires of single engines, just to have a three engine test where one engine still refused to cooperate. Finally, after four additional spin primes, Booster 7 managed to test seven engines successfully, then 14. And when it finally came to the grand 33 engine static fire, two engines still failed the test. It took an immense amount of testing to reach the 33 engine static fire, and even then it wasn't 100% successful. So what does all this tell us? Rocket engineering is a complex beast, unpredictable and filled with challenges. Each test, each failure and each success is a stepping stone toward perfection. With Booster 9 things changed, the test campaign has been swift but ambitious. Just one cryo test, one spin prime and SpaceX was already aiming for the stars with a 33 engine test. Let's put this into perspective, firing 29 out of 33 engines? That's not just impressive, it's a rocket engineering marvel, especially when recalling Booster 7's initial struggles with just 3 engines. And that's not even the full picture, the engines on Booster 9 aren't exactly fresh of the assembly line. Their serial numbers range from Raptor 73 to Raptor 186, a staggering difference of over 100 serial numbers. 
Imagine the evolution, the tweaks and the refinements that could have occurred over those 100 engines. Each iteration might have different timing tolerances and some of these engines even share the same lineage as those on Booster 7. SpaceX has the challenge of running 33 engines that are all slightly different in how they are built and what they can do and can't. There are two important things to remember. First, SpaceX mentioned testing a new firing sequence. Perhaps it's a matter of fine-tuning, synchronizing everything down to the millisecond. After all, even the tiniest deviation can throw off the entire startup. Secondly, it might be best not to jump to conclusions about the Raptors being at fault here. Yes, they shut down prematurely, but the reasons could be as vast as the cosmos itself. Was it a hiccup with a quick disconnect arm that spins up the Raptor boost engines? Or perhaps an internal spin-up system glitch? How about fuel flow trouble caused by a complex manifold connecting all those engines to several tanks at once? What I'm driving at is the essence of testing. A Starship is a symphony of tens of thousands of parts and any single one could be the culprit behind an aborted test. Just because the Raptor is shut down early doesn't necessarily mean they are unreliable or flawed. Looking at it from the outside, we lack the information needed to determine what exactly went wrong. Fast forward to just two days after the static fire, Booster 9 was taken down using Mechazilla's arms and placed on a transport stand. Next, two SPM transporters made their way down Highway 4, moving the booster to the first megabay. With recent modifications done to this building, it seems ready to take on the task of retrofitting the prototypes with hot staging hardware. While installing the ring might be possible with a crane or even with the chopsticks, Booster 9 likely needs heavy shielding, more easily installed or welded in the mega bay. At this point, you may be wondering what's next on the checklist for the second launch. Excellent question, thanks for asking. In a mere two weeks, I expect we might witness the complete upgrade, with Booster 9 rolling back to the launch site for its final Mechazilla lift. After that, the only way it will leave the launch mount is by using its own thrust, just like its predecessor. Super Heavy will then likely undergo another static fire to validate the new startup sequence again. Then it will be time for Ship 25 to leave the Rocket Garden and join forces with a massive booster. A quick wet dress rehearsal later to simulate flight-like conditions, the whole stack should be ready for another launch with one thing remaining. There's still the ongoing FAA investigation. We don't have insights into how it's going, but hopefully with the pressure of waiting for the second orbital attempt, the process won't take too much longer. Assuming everything goes according to plan, I'd expect that SpaceX would be ready to launch by the end of September. What do you think? Is that a realistic prediction? Do you have your own revised schedule after the static fire? Please let me know in the comments. With a period of no testing, workers have some time to apply the finishing touches to the orbital launch mount itself. Fortunately, it looks like virtually no repair work is needed after the test. The 29 Raptors simply had zero chance of damaging the base of the launch mount. Apart from some paint chipping away, nothing suggests that the water system performed anything less than at least adequate. This gives us hope that during the launch itself we will see big clouds of steam and not concrete flying everywhere. After Booster 9 was taken down, some scaffolding went up at the launch deck and engineers turned their attention to adding additional shielding to the booster quick disconnect as well as the OLM's legs. Preparations are also underway to welcome the third water tank that's already on its way to Starbase. A spreader bar similar to the one used during the lift of the previous two tanks was moved to the launch site. This suggests that we're just days, maybe even hours away from the arrival of the third tank. Yes! The installation process itself should be relatively quick. With the expanded capacity of the water system, we can feel assured that lack of water won't be an issue during the next launch. Moving to the build side, things appear to have temporarily slowed down a bit. In the high bay, the home of ship prototypes, we can still find both Ship 30 on the left and Ship 29 on the right. Just when we thought the second ship was headed to Massey's, the test stand rolled back empty. Don't worry, the time will come. Over in the first megabay, the action is heating up. 
Booster 9 is getting its treatment while Booster 12 has been almost ready for a few weeks now. The final frontier, mating the liquid oxygen and methane tanks. Could SpaceX be keeping an eye on Booster 9's performance before committing to the next super heavy prototype? It is a possibility. Now let's shift our gaze to something intriguing happening at SpaceX's tracking stations. Nestled right next to the build site, this station is home to two massive S-band antennas moved there from Kennedy Space Center back in 2017. These two giant dishes were tasked with tracking Crew Dragon capsules during launch, a duty they've performed to this day. They've also played a crucial role in gathering telemetry data from Starship during test events and flights. But here is where the plot thickens. Over the last few days, both dishes were dismantled. A mystery? Perhaps. But let's explore some theories. One possibility is that SpaceX plans to refurbish them or install new, more capable ones. A technological upgrade, if you will. Or, and here is where things get really interesting, perhaps they are planning to switch to a Starlink-based system. After all, we know that the Starship prototypes are equipped with Starlink dishes, and there's been chatter about using Starlink with Crew Dragon during the Polaris mission. So what's the real story behind the dismantled dishes? A simple upgrade, a shift to Starlink, or something else entirely? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. I always take a good look at what you're thinking. While you're at it, smash that like button, subscribe, share this video with your family and friends, and consider becoming a Y supporter. For as low as a dollar per month, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries from Chief. Over 100 high quality photos every single day and countless other extras on top. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. The link to our Patreon page is in the description. Thanks to thousands of supporters who enable us to do what we love doing the most, deliver high quality videos twice a week. You rock. While Starship is gearing up for its second flight attempt, Falcon 9, another of SpaceX's rockets, continues its regular launch schedule. On August 3rd, a Falcon 9 night launch took place at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station SpaceX pad, also known as Slick 40. But this time, no Starlings were inside the ferry. Instead, SpaceX launched the Galaxy 37 satellite, a geostationary telecommunication satellite built by Maxar Technologies for Intelsat. This launch carried significant financial implications. If Intelsat can make this satellite operational by year's end, it will clear the 300 megahertz band, opening it up for 5G network expansion and receive nearly 9 billion in incentive payments from cell operators. That is quite a sum. The launch also marked the sixth reuse of Booster B1077, culminating in another successful landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship. But SpaceX's busy week didn't end there. Next up was a Starlink mission, marked as Group 6-8. This launch saw 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites lifting off again from Space Launch Complex 40. A cherry on top of this launch was the fifth successful landing of Booster B1078 on a shortfall of Gravitas. Are you ready for groundbreaking advancements in safeguarding your privacy? Look no further because today's video sponsor, Incogni, has an incredible solution just for you. Frustrated by robocalls, spam emails and targeted advertising invading your digital space? It's time to take back control. Data brokers are consuming every aspect of your online identity, but fear not, I've discovered a game-changing solution. Wondering why you're bombarded with spam after searching for health insurance or summer camps? Companies collect your data and sell it to brokers who spread it far and wide. But brokers must delete your data upon request. Enter Incogni, your ultimate guardian of privacy, ready to ensure the utmost protection for your personal information. Creating an account and authorizing Incogni to act on your behalf is all it takes. Sit back, relax, and let them handle everything for you, system fixed. And there's more! The first 100 people to use my exclusive promo code FELIX at incogni.com slash FELIX will enjoy a massive 60% discount instead of 20. Join Incogni today and take control of your digital journey.
In true SpaceX fashion, another launch followed just a day later, lighting up California's sky. This time, booster B-1075 carried just 15 V-2 Starlinks into orbit with the low number of satellites caused by fuel-costly maneuvers. They could really use a Starship helping with Starlink deployment. Just saying. Though we might be somewhat spoiled by SpaceX's success, this launch marked yet another triumphant landing on the of course I still love you barge. This never gets old. So far SpaceX has an average of 4 days between two launches for 2023. Caption that. SpaceX's focus is mostly on delivering cargo into space, but every so often they also launch people, continuing to push the boundaries of space exploration and technology. We've witnessed numerous Crew Dragon launches encompassing both government-sponsored and private missions. Now it seems another launch has been booked, this time through Axiom Space. This company is no stranger to the space community. They've already orchestrated two private missions to the International Space Station and they are not stopping there. One launch is already on the calendar for the first quarter of 2024, where four individuals, Michael Lopez Alegria, Walter Villade, Alpa Gazeravich and Marcus Wundt will spend approximately two weeks at the station. But Axiom's plans extend even further. A few months after scheduling the AX-3 mission, NASA selected Axiom for the AX-4 mission, set to launch no earlier than August 2024. Though no crew members were initially announced, the Polish space agency Polsa recently revealed that ESA's astronaut Slavoj Uznanski will be part of the mission. This announcement was quite unexpected. Slavoj joined the European Space Agency's astronaut reserve in 2022, and there were no indications that he would be going to space anytime soon. However, with this confirmation, he will become the second pole to cross the boundary of space and the first to do so as an astronaut. The previous Polish space traveler Hermaszewski launched from the USSR's territory, earning the title of a cosmonaut. While SpaceX continues to prepare for another ISS mission, Boeing unfortunately still struggles with their demo mission. The contract between these two companies highlights the dynamic and sometimes unpredictable nature of the difficult commercial space industry. Back when Boeing received their contract for Starliner, everyone thought that SpaceX would be the one not to deliver on time. Six crew missions have come and gone, and yet Starliner is the one still not to launch with people on board. Unfortunately, it appears that this state won't change in the near future. Recently, some intriguing information emerged regarding Starliner's first crewed attempt. Most notably, a 2023 launch is officially off the table. Mark Nappi, Boeing's commercial crew program manager, has stated that the capsule will be ready to fly by early March 2024. However, this is contingent on the availability of an Atlas V rocket, which it is worth noting doesn't launch very frequently. Currently, the teams have removed several pounds of insulating tape that protects Starliner's electrical wiring. This action was prompted by a discovery in June that under specific conditions this tape could become flammable. I don't think I have to explain why bringing anything flammable into space isn't the best idea, especially if it's wrapped around electrical cables. Meanwhile, crews have uncovered problems with the parachutes, specifically that their soft link joints could tear apart during landing, a second potentially fatal flaw. This issue is expected to be resolved by November, when a drop test with new improved parachutes will be conducted. According to Boeing, just one test is all that is needed to ensure the future crew's safety. I don't know, just one? I hope this is correct. As these fixes are underway, Boeing remains under scrutiny with three independent investigations. One from an independent team at Boeing and two at NASA. The hope is that Starliner will finally get its act together and actually send anyone to space before the ISS is deorbited. I know this is salty, but we'll eventually reach the point at which it almost makes no sense anymore to develop Starliner further. Lastly, we're diving into the latest scoop of news from the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Kicking off on July 14th, this Indian lunar lander has been moonbound for nearly a month and boy has it been a journey. Three mission phases down and Chandrayaan-3 is just getting started. Phase 1, the launch and five earthbound maneuvers that shot the spacecraft into orbit, ready to be snagged by the moon's gravity. Talk about a cosmic dance. 
Then came phase two, the transfer trajectory phase, where Chandrayaan-3 coasted through space until the moon's gravity gave it a friendly tug. But wait, we are not looking for a flyby here. We want to get up close and personal with the silver globe. So on August 5th, the propulsion module did its thing, firing its engines in a maneuver known as a lunar orbit insertion. Now we're talking an elliptical orbit around the moon and Chandrayaan-3 is doing the moonwalk, this time gradually lowering its orbit instead of raising it. August 9th saw another successful burn, bringing the orbit down to a cozy 174 by 1437 kilometers or 108 by 893 miles. And guess what? More action is coming with burns scheduled for August 14th and 20th. Once Chandrayaan-3 hits that sweet spot of 100 by 100 kilometers or around 62 by 62 freedom miles, it's time for phase 5. The lunar module will bid adieu to the propulsion module and get ready for its grand entrance. Crash course with the moon? Not on Chandrayaan's watch, it'll power on its engines just in time to gently kiss the lunar surface. The target? The moon's south pole region right between the Manzanus Sea and Sympelius N craters. And the fun doesn't stop there. A small rover will roll out armed with an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer and a laser-induced breakdown spectroscope. Lunar soil prepare to be analyzed. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This mission's predecessor, Chandrayaan-2, had a bumpy ending. So we're all crossing our fingers for a smooth landing this time around. Will Chandrayaan-3 make history or follow 2's footsteps? Place your bets in the comments. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. Link is in the description. And if you want to get even smarter about space and rockets, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Athletic neck neck Spreader! Yay! Now we're talking! Merlin! To simulate! No! Instead! <laughs>